Grace and peace are yours from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. This Sunday is the second Sunday in the season of Advent. For approximately 1,500 years, the New Testament Christian Church has been celebrating the season of Advent. See, believers realize that it's probably a good idea to prepare to celebrate the birth of Christ. It's also a pretty good idea to prepare to receive Jesus again on the last day, or the day when we die. We're going to see Jesus, and so we ought to get ready. Christians, for hundreds and hundreds of years, have realized that there's many different things that call for our attention. And maybe the further along we get in history, the more those calls come. And you would expect that. The devil's pretty good at identifying those times in our life that we really focus on Jesus, and he provides a whole bunch of distractions for us. Certainly, this most wonderful time of the year leading up to Christmas is also the busiest time of the year. And this year, we might say it's the craziest year ever. There are so many things that are calling for our attention, so many things that we might be tempted to listen to. During the season of Advent, the Lord gives us that opportunity to listen to him, to listen to his word. And sometimes we might think, I've got to find the right way to prepare. Pastors fall into that temptation at times where this Advent season we preach a little bit more than we do other times of the year, but it's a time when the illustrations are kind of run out. I mean, there's so many, so many sermons you can preach about putting up the lights or setting up the decorations or the, the perfect Christmas present and then apply that to Christmas. You've heard it all before. So maybe we got to think outside of the box a little bit. Wouldn't it be great if we could get a live nativity scene? Oh, and have it in church on Christmas Eve? Oh, that would be great. We would be ready for Christmas, or our choir could produce the perfect Christmas anthem that would just fill our hearts with so much joy that we would be ready. Maybe that thinking shows that we don't necessarily always trust and believe what God tells us in his word about his word. We've got to find something else. Something new, something novel, something that will grab our attention and hold it throughout the Advent season and take us right to Christmas so that it will be the best Christmas ever. Then we'll be prepared. This idea of being prepared for the coming of Christ is not unique to the New Testament church. It's also found in the Old Testament. Among those Old Testament believers who were waiting for the Messiah to come, they struggle just like we do. But God's answer to them and their preparation to celebrate that first Christmas is the same answer he gives to us as we prepare to celebrate Christmas and Christ's return. And that answer is, let's listen. In just a few minutes, I'm going to read to you the verses from Isaiah chapter 40 that will serve as our sermon text for this morning. And as I read those verses, you will hear phrases like this. Speak tenderly, proclaim, a voice calling, a voice cries out. You who bring good tidings, say to the towns, here is your God. The Lord wants us to listen. The Lord wants us to give attention to his word, because it's through the word of the Lord that the Lord prepares us for Christmas, prepares us to meet Christ and spend eternity with him in heaven. So listen. Listen to the words of Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 through 11. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for. 
that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling, In the wilderness prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough places, the rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are like grass, and all their faithfulness is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall. The word of our God endures forever. You who bring good news to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good news to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up. Do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power. He rules with a mighty arm. See, his reward is with him, and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. For 39 chapters, the book of Isaiah has been a lot of law. A lot of law to the people of God who had not been listening to the word of the Lord. So the Lord sent his prophet Isaiah to get the people ready to meet the Lord. And he announced God's judgment. God's judgment on the nations around Israel that had rejected God and his people. And God's judgment on his own people who were not listening to the Lord. There are some amazing gospel verses in the first chapters of Isaiah. But there is amazing how many people just didn't listen. And so the Lord was hammering them. He was pounding them with his law. And it worked. It crushed those people. And the Lord knew it. We have an evangelical God, a God who is, is longing to show mercy and love to people. And so he brings that comfort to his people. In Isaiah chapter 40, it's this very noticeable shift from law to gospel. The people who were crushed under the weight of their sin heard that good news. Comfort, comfort. Speak tenderly to my people. Tell her that her hard labor is done, that her sins are paid for. And she's going to receive double from the Lord's hand. That was God's message of peace to his people that he so wanted to bring to them. All he wanted them to do was listen. It tells us so much about our God who wants to bring comfort to us, wants us to open our ears to listen to the good news. Those Old Testament people were directed ahead to the promise of the Savior that was going to be fulfilled. Isaiah had given them information about this Messiah, and more was coming. It was a message of comfort. Sins are paid for. And the message hasn't changed as we prepare for our Christmas. Comfort, comfort, my people. Speak tenderly, God says. Your sins are taken away. That gets us ready. That gets us ready for Christmas, no matter what burden of sin we're carrying with us. No matter what we remember from our past that haunts us. We're ready because God brings us a message of comfort, no matter what's going on in our life, no matter what we're facing in life, or experiencing, or feeling. God says, comfort, comfort, my people. That's us. He speaks to our heart individually. You're my child. Your sins are forgiven. Eternal life is yours. That's how God gets us ready for Christmas. By speaking very direct, directly and plainly about his love for us in Christ. That message works. That message of forgiveness in Christ works. When Adam and Eve fell into sin, God called them to repent. It's the first time, so it was a new experience for them. But as they're standing there, just in the burden of their sin, God made a promise. We hear it every time Christmas rolls around. Right? The offspring of the woman will crush the head of the devil. 
The first gospel promise in Genesis 3, verse 15, was so plain and so clear, and Adam and Eve believed it. That was the one verse they had. They had one gospel promise from God, and they believed it. In Genesis chapter 4, when Eve gave birth to her first son, she said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man, or the man. And it seems like Eve possibly thought that this son was the fulfillment of that prophecy, that this was going to be the Savior. And she learned, no, he was a murderer. His name was Cain. But she still believed. And then throughout the Old Testament, God gave more information. He, he colored in more of the details about this plan of salvation, the virgin birth, the place of his birth, the work of the Messiah. Over and over, God repeated these things. And not only did he speak it to them, he also illustrated it with a worship life. A worship life that centered on forgiveness through sacrifice. The people of Israel would come to Jerusalem and bring their offerings, their sacrifices, and they would watch them die and be burned up on that altar of sacrifice. Everything about Old Testament life, hearing the word and worshiping was centered on that message. But the people stopped listening. They got lazy. They got comfortable. And they started to miss out on what God was saying to them. In these beautiful verses from Isaiah chapter 40, the Lord knew that that was going to happen. And so he gave a prophecy. A prophecy that we find fulfilled in John the Baptist. The voice from the wilderness calling, What shall I cry out? straight the way for the Lord. Every valley shall be filled up and the mountain brought low. The rough places a plain. Prepare the way for the Lord. John the Baptist wasn't the only one, but he was the last one before Jesus. Prepare the way for the Messiah. And John did that by preaching a message of repentance. For the people of his day, the Pharisees that came out to meet him, repent. And the sin that was plaguing them was this self-righteous attitude, this pride that, that gloried in, in earthly adornments, in their own lifestyle, their own service to God. John said, repent, you bunch of snakes. Turn away from that sin. That's how John prepared the way for the Savior. And it wasn't just the Pharisees, it was everybody that came out to meet him in the wilderness. John's message was the same, Repent. And then look. Look at the Lamb of God. There's Jesus. He takes away the sin of the world. That's how God prepared those people to receive Christ. That's how he prepares people today to receive Christ. Repent. And look at the Lamb of God. John the Baptist was a powerful preacher the, the crowds were out there, and, and people recognized that about him, and he, he grabbed the attention. People listened to him. Sometimes I wonder what John would preach today to us for a specific law. What, what sins would he identify in the people of our world today, and, and what would he call out? What would he say to us? I wonder if John might get after us a little bit for... The, the way that we become so enamored with the, the shiny things in life. The things that do bring us joy. The things that make us happy. But the things that we just have to have. And when we don't have them, we're just distraught. John would say, repent. Because those things are obstacles. Those things get in the way of our relationship with God, even when they're blessings that God showers upon us. And the illustration that's used in this text is, is interesting. He talks about the grass and the flowers, and how beautiful they are. How beautiful the things are in this world that God graciously provides. But they wither and they die. 
gone. Then what do you have left? I still got myself. All men, all people are like grass. There it is. That's the message. The wages of sin is death. The soul that sins is the one that will die because you ate from this tree. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. That is the breath of the Lord. That is the message of his law that speaks to us, that grabs our attention this Advent season. But the word of the Lord endures forever. And what is the word of the Lord? Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The virgin will be with child and give birth to a son, and you will call him Emmanuel. You are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sin. Comfort, comfort my people. That is the word of the Lord, and that is what endures forever and ever and ever. The beautiful thing about that gospel message is that it's true no matter what's going on, no matter what we're experiencing in life, it's always there. God's message of forgiveness and peace that we have in Jesus, our Savior. Comfort, comfort my people. Listen to the word of the Lord. He prepares you for Christmas. He prepares you for Christ's return because he focuses your attention on your Savior and all the blessings he brings into your life. And as we wait for that day, Christmas, or the last day, God continues to speak to us and guide us in those paths of righteousness and direct us to Jesus. Listen in the last verses of our text, how he describes that. He says, you who bring good news to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good news to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up, do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power and he rules with a mighty arm. See, his reward is with him, his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. This message of comfort is one that God wants to go out all the time. Throughout our life, he wants it to go out. He wants us to hear it and take it to heart and apply it to our life because through that message of comfort, God is shepherding us. He is guiding us through this light and focusing our attention on our eternal life in heaven. Listen to that message. It's what God calls us to do in the season of Advent and throughout our life. So how do we keep your attention? That's a question a lot of pastors ask. Maybe not just pastors, maybe parents, teachers, anyone who wants to speak a message to someone else and understands the importance of that message. Listen. Shake them. Listen. Raise your voice. Teachers are good at that, and pastors too. Parents scream a little bit, maybe even elevate it past the level of the teacher. Pay attention. Sometimes if you say nothing at all, just stop and stare and look at somebody. Finally, they're going to get uncomfortable. Maybe, whoa, what's going on? You might say, well, keep your sermon under 15 minutes, and I should be able to make it. Pay attention. The Lord wants to prepare our hearts by speaking to us. Speaking to us through his word and through our worship life. Yesterday morning and into early afternoon, a group of ladies spent over four hours here at church decorating for Christmas. Christmas decorations serve to focus us on God's messages in, in word and, and in visuals. Decorations do that. This year there was a really interesting decoration that I found in church 
when I walked in here this morning. I put it away, but I'm going to get it back out. It was right on the communion rail right here. It was this. <laughs> the Christmas hammer. Leanne, you were looking for that. <laughs> or oh, Anthony's awake. <laughs> and I thought, wow, that's an interesting decoration. <laughs> but it fits with the message of John the Baptist, doesn't it? Listen to the message of God's law. Repent. Right? The law brings that crushing message to our hearts that so often long for the things of this life. And we're hopeless. And helpless, just like the people in Isaiah chapter 40. And the Lord says, comfort, comfort my people. And he brings us this beautiful gospel message. And it's so beautifully pictured for us in our Christmas decorations that center us on Jesus. The babe of Bethlehem was born to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The cross where he gave up his life but rose again in victory on the third day for our justification. The peace that we have through that message and, and through the water and the word of our holy baptism and in Jesus' body and blood from the Lord's Supper. Comfort, comfort my people. If you do nothing else to prepare for Christmas this year, remember that you're ready. Because the word of the Lord has been proclaimed to you. And the word of the Lord endures forever. And the word of the Lord works to bring you that beautiful Christmas comfort. That Christ has been born for you. That Jesus is your Savior, the Lamb of God, who gave his life in your place. And who so graciously opened the door to eternal life in heaven got a few weeks before Christmas. God, help us to listen to that message. And God, fill our hearts with joy and comfort and peace as we listen to that good news again and again.